Hi everyone, welcome to um, Hidden Belfield's talk on the Nordics and whether they are existential risk leaders. Um, Hidden has been a research associate and academic project manager at the University of Cambridge's Center for the Study of Existential Risk for the past six years. In that time, the center has tripled in size and he advised the UK, US and Singaporean governments, the EU, UN and OECD and leading technology companies. Uh, Hidden will be taking questions in person, so feel free to just raise your hands when you have questions, when the question and answer session starts. But please wait for me to bring the mic to you so it can be recorded well. Thank you so much. Without further ado, can we have a short applause and welcome Hayden on board. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming during FICA. Hopefully, there will still be some uh, coffee and tea and things uh, downstairs afterwards. Uh, oh, I should, didn't bring up my clicker. That would be useful. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, OK, so today I'm going to talk about uh, this topic. Uh, world leaders, I guess it should say world leaders in reducing existential risks, hopefully not, uh, ho hopefully not contributing to it. Um, so just a bit about myself. Uh, I work at uh, two centers at the University of Cambridge. Uh, one's called the Leverhulme Center of the Future of Intelligence, um, which kind of does everything to do with AI. And the other one is the uh, Center for the Study of Existential Risk, which does everything to do with existential risk. And you know, where they overlap is where I do uh, a lot of my work. Uh, and by existential risk, we mean something like uh, risks that could lead to human extinction or, or civilizational collapse. So uh, our research group, we're about kind of like 25 people, and uh, we do work on a, a bunch of different kind of themes across existential risk. So we've got bio in here, here in the top left, AI that I mentioned in the top right. This bottom left is supposed to be environmental risks, climate change, and other things like that. And then this bottom right one is not Italy. Italy is not uh, an existential risk. Uh, it is supposed to represent systemic risk and cross-cutting issues uh, in existential risk. So this talk is a bit of a kind of follow-up or a kind of sequel of sorts to one I gave um, back in January 2018, uh, sort of five years ago, uh, to uh, some folks at EA Norway. Uh, and in that talk, Five years ago, I said that uh, climate change is really worrying, and you know, is is a, 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 is uh, carrying on at, a, at an increasing pace. I said we need to be prepared for the next pandemic, which could be coming very soon, and which could kill you know millions or tens of millions of people. I said, you know, we haven't got rid of all of our nuclear weapons; they still exist. There's still a risk of a, of a nuclear crisis happening. And I said, oh, we also really need to be worried about the increased pace of uh, developments in AI. And uh, yeah, nothing happened on any of those topics in the last five years. So everything's been fine. But so, I mean, so I made some, some suggestions uh, then. And I've been thinking about, uh, so I've been interested in what the, uh, the Nordic countries in general, you know, I'm from the UK, you might be asking, was this British guy up here doing, you know, spouting off on this topic? Well, hopefully I've got some things that I can kind of suggest a bit from the outside, but after qu quite a lot of engagement with, um, with this community and with kind of academics and, and thinkers in the Nordic space. So, uh, the, so I've, I've kind of given a bit of a brief intro here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about current efforts where I think uh, the Nordics are doing like really great stuff on re reducing existential risks. I'll talk a little bit about the theory of why we might expect um, uh, the Nordics to be able to do really well here. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about, you know, a, a few kind of hot takes on uh, possible future options. You know, some kind of sensible the ones that I'm sure we'll all agree with, and then some uh, slightly weirder ones that hopefully will uh, pr uh, provoke you and, and, and uh, be interesting. So basically, but the overall argument of the entire talk is the Nordics can and should be a world leader, and you, the people here in this room, uh, should encourage uh, the, the, the Nordic countries to, uh, to be a world leader on reducing existential risks. Okay, so uh, I'll go now to talking about uh, current efforts. So this is just basically what I mean, I'm gonna take to mean the Nordic states, uh, I, you know, 
we were just talking earlier about there's some possibility of like, does Estonia count? Do the, the Baltics in general count? But I'm just gonna mainly focus on, 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 on these five here. These five are doing really well, right? So uh, this is the HDI, uh, the Human Development Index, and uh, you can see that uh, all these five are kind of in the, in the top 11 here, uh, doing well domestically, clearly, but then also doing uh, well, uh, good, good global citizens generally. So this is the uh, development assistance, how generous uh, countries are in, this is uh, uh, by uh, per capita, and you can see again that they're in the kind of the most generous uh, globally and just kind of just good uh, responsible citizens in general of the world. However, uh, oh, and also you can see this uh, with uh, climate emissions as a kind of another uh, way of uh, thinking about this topic. That there's this peak back in the 70s, but then over the, pre over the um, subsequent decades, um, these countries have been making big strides to reducing their emissions. And, and so, you know, 98% of electricity production in Norway now comes from renewable sources. Uh, they're also, the Nordics are also doing quite a lot uh, in terms of, of the issues that we're particularly concerned about. So here we have uh, Margarete Versteer, who's the uh, competition commissioner at the European Union, and also has also been leading a lot of the work around the EU AI Act. That's uh, Jens Stoltenberg looking appropriately kind of stern and uh, taciturn as uh, the head of NATO. And then at the bottom right here is Beatrice Finn, who is the executive director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, uh, winning the Nobel Peace Prize for the uh, passing of the treaty to, on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, so Nordic people, you know, are doing uh, very influential things. And then we also see that several institutions and several interesting uh, approaches uh, based here in the Nordics. We've got that's the, the Svalbard Seed Vault, which um, is a kind of insurance scheme for uh, seeds. So national seed, vault, uh, seed um, banks of different countries send their seeds as like a backup and are kept up in Svalbard. And indeed they had their first withdrawal a few years ago from Syria, where the Syrian seed bank kind of burnt down or was burnt down, and it was able to restock from uh, from the vault. Uh, you you have here uh, at the bottom left the uh, uh, Finnish Committee of the Future, bringing together a number of different committees for the for future generations from around the world. Top right here, uh, the uh, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, a partnership, a public-private partnership to develop vaccines. And then uh, the bottom right, one that people might be slightly less familiar with, but I think is really interesting, the uh, Stockholm Initiative on Nuclear Disarmament, which has been, it's, it's a collection of 16 countries that are you know, not, uh, not the kind of main nuclear weapon states themselves, but uh, ones that are interested in uh, nuclear disarmament and have been laying out, kind of tr trying to lay out some stepping stones and concrete actions that could be taken. And then kind of even more directly, uh, on existential risk, we've heard uh, about some uh, very exciting and awesome new uh, initiatives that have just been launched or uh, are soon going to be launched. Uh, uh, MIMIR at the Institute for uh, Future Stud Studies and the Center for Long-Term uh, Policies. And then also there's other uh, groups around the Nordics. So at Chalmers and at Copenhagen, there's uh, researchers that are working on these issues, and there's the Global Challenges Foundation, a very interesting uh, funder and organization in this space. So uh, people are already doing great things. We're not starting from scratch. It's kind of, can we build on these current efforts to do even more and, be, and contribute even more to reducing existential risks? So that was the, the current efforts, and now I'm gonna talk a bit about why, we, why it might be particularly good to, to go down this and to explore this uh, uh, in, in, Nordic, in Nordic countries. So first of all, uh, this, is the, this is the combined population of the Nordic countries, uh, 27 million. That's about the same as Australia. And if you combine uh, GDP together, that's again about similar to Australia. So like a classic kind of you know, middle, medium power, middle power, uh, uh, in, 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 in the world. So I think 
as people have suggested earlier in, in previous discussions today, this is like a double-edged sword. So obviously that limits the amount of impact one can have, but that's also good in terms of being able to uh, reach people, being able to have the impact, being able to change things. Um, and in general, I think small countries can have an impact by the force of their example and by championing uh, new ideas. So uh, this was talked about a bit uh, earlier, but I think uh, this is really a uh, piece worth going back and reading. I think it's really great. Uh, the case for increasing EA policy efforts in smaller countries, uh, where they are mo mainly focusing on small, rich, well-functioning, high-trust societies with a global reputation for good governance. Uh, and just to kind of reiterate, this three ways that this can have impact much way beyond its borders is, uh, is through this uh, idea of policy diffusion. So experimenting with different policies, showcasing the ones that really work, and then championing either those policies or multilateral policies at a, at a, at a global level. And there are a number of reasons. You can go uh, read the, the uh, post for more, but just a few things. Good access, good conditions for testing, low risk of accidents, and then strong reputation to increase the likelihood of this diffusion, and uh, these might last. So I think those are all good reasons for uh, kind of expect, that's the kind of theory of why the Nordics might be particularly good. But then, okay, uh, perhaps the more uh, spicier part, possible future options for that we could be considering for reducing existential risk here in, uh, here in the Nordics. So I thought I may as well start with this one. So uh, this is a report that I was part of, uh, I was part of the Global Priorities Project, which doesn't exist anymore, uh, but I was part of this, uh, writing this report for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland uh, way back in, in 2017, a long time ago. And it actually, but I think it, like, a lot of it bears up and a lot of it's still pretty interesting. So the three kind of like key recommendations of that report were get better at geoengineering governance, that's still good, still should be doing that. Uh, do better scenario planning for pandemics. Well, we've unfortunately lived through one of those, but uh, the specific suggestion was a scenario planning for a kind of uh, a pandemic of, of human nature. And well, depending on your view on the lab leak hypothesis, we may have already lived through that as well. But I think that's still something that should that could be explored. I think that kind of scenario planning uh, for the next pandemic, we should just be doing it. We shouldn't be allowing the uh, skills and the knowledge that we've like built up at some cost over the last few years to, we shouldn't be allowing that to atrophy. But the main thing, the, the third of the main uh, recommendations was around championing existential risk and championing um, actions to control them at the international level. And actually, I think this, you can maybe see one way that this has actually been taken up is with our common agenda. So this is a report from the, the Secretary General of the United Nations which actually basically suggests uh, that uh, a re global risks are a global public good. No one country can gain, can capture all the benefits from reducing them, and therefore there's a key role for the United Nations to play in coordination and in uh, working to both represent future generations and to reduce those those risks. Um, I think uh, so. The common our common agenda is currently working its way through the kind of. Uh, Byzantine machinery of the United Nations, but I think this is one thing that we should just be kind of uh, uh, championing and supporting and trying to uh, make make the best of. So that's I think uh, one uh, interesting possibility. Uh, and on the kind of experiment and showcase piece, uh, so I've done some work with the Center for Long Term Resilience in London, down in Westminster. And they've laid out a very interesting proposal around how to improve resilience uh, in, in, uh, at a country level, building on best practice in the corporate world. So the idea is three lines of defense. You've got your first line where it's very clear risk ownership of di different risks. Then you have chief, a chief risk officer and, and an office of risk management across the whole of the government. And then you have this third line, which is an independent, uh, they call it a National Extreme Risks Institute. Um, so the idea is that uh, risk is very clear, the ownership at different levels, and it's very clear who's checking that these are actually being done and this is, it's all, uh, uh, these risks are actually being managed. 
I think that's something that a small, rich, well-functioning, high-trust society can just like, you can instit institute this, you can make this happen, and then that would really be a, uh, a kind of showcase of this policy for the rest of the world. Uh, but that, okay, so let me just, those are, all, those are all, I think, you know, pretty sensible, reasonable suggestions, but let's go a bit spicier. Uh, nuclear war, uh, thermonuclear war. So there was this, I think people may be familiar with like nuclear winter from the 1980s, but what people I don't think are, uh, have recognized sufficiently is that there's been, there's like, there were a few papers back then in the 80s, but actually there's been a whole wave of stuff done in the like last five, maybe 10 years um, using the latest climate modeling, revisiting this stuff uh, with a much, much higher level of rigor and uh, better levels of data. And the, the best paper on this, the single best paper, is, is called Global Food Insecurity and Famine from Reduced Crop, Marine Fishery and Livestock Production Due to Climate Disruption from Nuclear War Soot Injection by Ziet et al. Um, uh, from uh, 20, 2001. Uh, so the, the headline figure of that is that nuclear winter could lead to 5 billion deaths in the worst case scenario. So very bad. Let's, so this is the, at the lowest level. Basically, the, the uh, uncertainty around nuclear winter is how much soot from burning cities rises up into the atmosphere and then gets trapped there, which blocks out the sun. This is at the, at the kind of lowest level, five uh, teragrams. And then it goes all the way up to 150. Uh, and you obviously see in the difference in those things that like at the green level, a lot, you know, lots of countries do fine. But then uh, as you get to the kind of the highest, most extreme scenarios, it's, it, it's, it's very bad. Zooming in specifically on, uh, on the Nordics, apologies that this is so blurry, you can see that like in both of these scenarios, actually Scandinavia doesn't do very well at all. Um, it's a bit too close to Russia, it gets hit by a lot of that, and then it gets hit a lot by the climate uh, impacts. But you'll notice that Iceland actually does remarkably well in both these scenarios. Like even in the most extreme scenario, Iceland does uh, remarkably well. And indeed, this is borne out by other uh, lines of research. So uh, two great researchers, Matt Boyd and Nick Wilson, uh, who are in New Zealand. <coughs> um, this paper is from last year. Did this paper looking at different island refuges in uh, abrupt sunlight reduction scenarios, and they found that Iceland, in fact, is one of the best, uh, uh, the most resilient to these kinds of scenarios. You might also think of big supervolcano eruptions or asteroid impacts, things like that, things that could uh, block out the sun. But what, so why does Iceland do so well? Uh, it's got uh, basically uh, high uh, food exports, high food production, and these get hit, but they don't get hit too much. What would you actually eat in nuclear winter? I mean, fish, presumably, you know, fermented shark. Anything else? Yeah, spirulina. Uh, uh, spirulina, it's a type of blue-green algae with a really high uh, content of protein. It's actually got more protein in it than uh, uh, beef, apparently, lean beef. Uh, but And what's very interesting about it is that you can grow this with uh, just using electricity. So there's a interesting uh, trial run and Forgive me, it's the Hetlis Heithi uh, production unit. So this is a hydroelectric uh, production unit in Iceland uh, that they use this, uh, some of the uh, spare electricity to run LED cables, and they produce a lot of this spirulina at like a pretty low cost. And you can uh, look at what would happen if you scaled that up to a number of different production units, you know, a number of the different hydroelectric power plants around and geothermal uh, power plants around Iceland, as my colleagues, Catherine Richards, Asaf Shakur, and a few others uh, did recently. And it looks really good. So if you, if you scaled it up onto the most ambitious of estimates, you know, it feeds a number of different people at different levels, but at the most ambitious estimates, Iceland could be not only protein self-sufficient, it could also feed six million other people. So that's like feeding the whole of Iceland and Denmark, or the whole of Iceland and Finland, the whole of Iceland and Norway. So I think this is like a really interesting, so this is only a feasibility study, but I think you could do a lot more to explore. So this is something that, you know, colleagues from Iceland or who, uh, uh, who spend time there or uh, have contacts there could explore, you know, could we, uh, this is just a feasibility study, what more could, be, could we do to uh, look into this? And in general, 
like, I don't know whether, I, I, I assume people are familiar with this. Effective altruists love Huel for some reason. I don't know why. Huel's gross, and I think we should all be moving away from Huel and uh, Spirulina. That's the cool new thing. That's the thing that's going to be in everyone's uh, offices and everyone's, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's slightly less gross. <laughs> there we go. That's my that's my hot take. So okay, that's 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 Iceland, uh, Norway. Yeah, I, I, you know, I hesitate to <laughs> to make suggestions with people uh, in, in, here in the audience, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take a stab at it. So the seed vault is really awesome, but because of a quirk of Norwegian uh, law and Norwegian politics, you can't have genetically modified organisms in the seed vault, and this is just like uh, a kind of random little Norwegian uh, uh, rule. Uh, it, it seems a bit weird because like a big chunk of the calories that we get worldwide are from genetically modified wheat, genetically modified rice, things like that. I would suggest that we, if we can tweak the rules, these Norwegian rules to allow GMOs into the seed vault, that could be really uh, increase our resilience a lot. So another one is the Norges Bank here. Norway has, I think, the world's largest sovereign wealth fund, or at least it's certainly like one of the absolute largest in the entire world. And it's so huge, it's in you know, trillions and trillions. Uh, it owns a representative slice of the entire world economy because it can't be, its portfolio can't be invested too much in any one particular area, or one particular country. I think this gives it a lot of influence, a lot of power and impact, but it also means that it can't externalize any problems, right? Like if there's some problem in the world economy, that's gonna be, that's going to appear in their portfolio. So they shouldn't think of risks as just some like external thing that are someone else's problem. They should think, oh no, any global risk is like a direct hit to my incentives, and it's a direct hit to uh, Norwegian citizens, uh, current and future, whose money this is. So what things can they be doing? They're already doing a lot to divest from uh, fossil fuel uh, companies. Again, it's, it's kind of like bal balancing the portfolio. They exclude a number of uh, companies from their portfolio who are doing like, unethical things. But they, I think they could be doing a lot more, right? Like, so you can think uh, negatively, uh, excluding, for example, uh, fossil fuel bonds from uh, their investment portfolio, or positive investment. So investing, for example, in vaccine companies and things like that. Where does all this money come from? Uh, well, it comes from exporting uh, oil and, uh, and gas. And I'm just going to just briefly go through a suggestion of uh, another thing, which is I, I think Norway needs to do, which is come up with a long-term but plan to end uh, fossil fuel production. So some uh, fossil fuel production is obviously uh, going to be necessary in the, over the coming years. So gas production has, uh, has increased in Norway, but I think even your like, most kind of keen... Uh, uh, Green would probably say that's a good thing because it's mostly replacing uh, gas from, uh, from, from Putin's Russia. So there's going to be some kind of niches where we're going to need uh, Norwegian gas for some period of time. That's, you know, I think you know, pretty fairly reasonable. However, uh, looking at oil, Norway is one of the most... Uh, Norway is, if we can split oil producers into high and low cost... Norway's in the high cost, right? It's up there with Canada, it's up there with the US. It's not one of these low cost producers like Saudi Arabia or Qatar where it really is just, you know, you kind of drill a hole and you can, you can, you can produce fossil fuels uh, very, very cheaply. Um, there's been some really interesting work done by Mercure et al, uh, 2021. This is in, in, in a Nature Journal. You don't have to look at any of these graphs too specifically. The main takeaway is from the one on the, uh, the left, it's just about uh, which are the high cost and low cost producers. And we can see that like uh, there's some that are like very, very low cost, your Qatars, your Saudi Arabias. There are some that are much uh, higher cost. And then on the right here is kind of what your, uh, the, what's in the, the specific incentives of different countries around the world. And we can see that uh, the major energy importers, Europe and East Asia, would just get a huge, huge boost from uh, shifting away. They did various scenarios of what the, you know, the energy mix should be uh, in the world over the coming decades. And basically, you see that a shift to renewables is just directly in the self-interest of East Asia and of Europe. 
and they did some uh, some further scenarios and some game theory modeling, and this is what they think, and I would kind of stand by this, this is what's gonna happen in the energy sector over the coming uh, years and decades. We all have seen this like massive cost re uh, reduction in solar and in wind. Renewables are cheaper and better for energy security, so this means they've just got this direct incentive, no matter what happens, just, just decarbonize as fast as possible to save money. This would lead to a fall in demand. How do you respond to that fall in demand? Do you keep to your OPEC quotas or do you just flood the market to try and gain, to try and keep your market share? You flood it. And then how do you, how does that, res what does that mean? It, it leads to these cheap producers dominating these shrinking markets. So my argument would be that it's just, there is no future for a high cost uh, producer like Norway in uh, oil and in, in gas over the coming years and decades. We need to have like, one way you could, this could happen, it could, it could just happen in a massive crisis and chaotic way and really screw up a lot of uh, planning and a lot of uh, the economies of various countries. That's one way you could go about it. Or you could have a long-term, like, phased transition uh, out of oil and gas production. And I think that would be a lot better for Norway to begin planning. Well, you know, it's already begun, but to like, really take this seriously, uh, this plan to reduce the role of oil and gas production in the economy, in the export sector, for Equinor, and for the oil fund. They all need to be ready. So that's just some suggestions for, for Norway. Uh, looking at uh, other kind of areas of existential risk, this is a uh, map of the AI supply chain uh, that uh, my colleague Shinshin Hua and I uh, wrote last year. So we've got <coughs> it's got it's got six sections. You've got the chip design, and then you make the chips, then you assembly uh, you assemble them, then they get brought together in these huge uh, cloud providers. Then, you know, we're arguing this is the way things are going. They, you train some really huge model like GPT-4 or things like that, called a foundation model, and then you fine tune it for specific purposes. Uh, yeah, I think this is like a, a pretty interesting way to think about uh, the supply chain at a global level. One thing that I think is very important for the Nordics is that they're not really relevant to this supply chain really at all. I mean, like the, the key, there are like a few European countries that are particularly important. So uh, the Netherlands is very important for semiconductor manufacturing equipment. ASML, who produced the um, photolithography machines, they're basically the only ones in the world that can do it. In some aspects of chip design, there are people in the UK that are, are relevant. In foundation model training, obviously there's a few, you know, things like DeepMind. But really this is, this is not an area where uh, the Nordics really have much uh, compared to oil and gas to contribute on the kind of like supply itself. So does this mean that there's nothing that one can do about AI? Not at all. The Brussels effect, baby. So this is uh, mainly for, you know, I've, I've covered Iceland, I've covered Norway. This is for people in, in Sweden, Finland and Denmark. There was this great report by Charlotte Siegmund and Marcus Anderlung uh, suggesting that there will indeed be a Brussels effect for AI. So what the Brussels effect is, is Brussels sets some rules uh, for uh, some area and other countries and other companies around the world end up following them. So that's because the, uh, the EU is this like huge market of 450 million very rich consumers uh, with good regulators that can set a bar and when that happens, other countries kind of just end up copying them because it's easier. That's the de jure Brussels effect. And then companies, if you're some really big company, are you going to train two huge AI models? One that's like good and safe that passes EU rules and one that's like much worse? Probably not. You just train the one and then just use that one worldwide. And that's the, the, that's the de facto Brussels effect. So... <laughs> this is, uh, we already see this in a, in a number of different uh, areas, kind of like competition law and, and some um, product market rules, but we probably will see it in AI. So people will probably be familiar, but the EU AI Act is very close to passing. They've been working on it for the last uh, kind of two years since the proposal, and it's going to be leaving the European Parliament hopefully in the next few weeks or months, and then going to uh, the Council. Sweden is actually uh, currently has the presidency of the European Council and is very keen to kind of get this passed, get this done this year. So this is going to, I'll say a bit about what 
uh, that requires. But basically, yeah, I'll say a bit about what that requires. So the EU AI Act is going to cover uh, various kinds of high risk use cases. So that goes from facial recognition, but also the use of AI anywhere it can affect health and safety or affect citizens' rights or like kind of life outcomes. So education, if there's some AI system that's being used to determine you know, who gets what grades or who gets into universities, that's gonna get regulated. Uh, use in law enforcement, use in uh, management of critical infrastructure, in migration, in justice. And then crucially also, uh, a new addition in the last few years, it's also gonna cover general purpose AI systems. So this is AI systems that are used in a, uh, these kind of foundation models that are used across the economy in many different use cases. And that's very important and very relevant for uh, some of the kind of longer term concerns that especially this community has. Uh, these requirements, so those are the, the, the kind of things it's gonna mainly focus on. And these requirements are pretty, they're gonna be pretty strict, right? Uh, it's you're gonna, you have to have a risk management system. You have to make sure that all your data is uh, sourced uh, ethically and legally. You've got to keep quite a lot of records about what your system is actually doing and whether it actually leads to mistakes. Uh, you've got to ensure that there's oversight. And then uh, a really important one, the one that I'm just gonna focus in on really quickly, is this uh, requirements around accuracy, robustness, and cybersecurity. So these are the, this is the draft text and I'm not expecting you to read all of this, but I would just uh, draw your attention to the, the first line. This high level requirement, high risk AI systems shall be resilient as regards errors, faults, or inconsistencies. And then in the next one, uh, high, high risk AI systems shall be resilient as regards attempts by unauthorized third parties to alter their use or performance. These are both like, uh, these are like very high level and quite abstract, but these are really serious requirements, right? Like many systems that are currently being used would not pass this <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. They wouldn't be robust enough uh, to either you know, misuse or to accidents. So I think this will really kind of uh, set the bar quite strongly. So how does this work? This is, these will probably get passed again, as I say, in the next few weeks or months. And then, but these are very high level kind of abstract ones. This will then uh, get fleshed out um, over the next two years. Uh, the standardization re report is due at the end of January 2025 uh, by these two uh, committees called SEN and SEN SENELEC. I beg your pardon. Um, so these are uh, industry and civil society standardization setting uh, committees that operate across, on a, across Europe. For some reason, Britain is still in these. I don't know why. Uh, and these are gonna kind of flesh it out. These are gonna like add a lot of meat to the bones of the EUA Act and say like, well, what does it mean to be you know, robust or cyber secure or whatever? It means getting 80% on this benchmark or it means following this specific rules. So I think this is hugely important, right? This is like, this is AI safe, this is laws for AI safety. These are, this will really kind of set the bar uh, uh, globally and will encourage a lot more it will encourage a lot more research into how do you actually ensure that your systems can pass these requirements and all also create this whole new ecosystem of uh, AI auditing, AI testing, this community of people whose whole job it is is to just ensure AI safety and whose whole identity is like, oh, I'm the person who says, whoa, 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 you need to test this before you just roll it out in the world and it, and it harms people. So I think that's uh, really important, you know, people here in the audience can contribute by uh, getting on national standardization committees if you have relevant expertise, or maybe considering spending some time uh, down in Brussels. So I think you know, passing, the e passing the EU AI Act, one very important thing, and then uh, fleshing out uh, what that means in practice, also uh, very important. Kind of uh, related to this, so that's on the civilian side, it only covers kind of civilian uses of AI. Uh, but uh, also very relevant is the use of AI in defense and security. And what's nice is that everyone in, is, is in, in NATO. NATO, so uh, the, the two things we have on the right here is a great report uh, from the US, from CSET, and this great report from the Ministry of Defense in the, the UK. So both the US and the UK, you know, kind of leading it, but lots of other countries are involved, are looking into how do you do this kind of testing and assurance for defense AI systems. 
and also what kinds of accountability structures do you need to put in place so that if anything does go wrong, we can know it precisely whose fault it is, right? So like, it's not some defense minister who's standing up who, who says, oh, it was just a shame, who knows whose problem it is. It's like, oh, it was this particular officer who procured this thing when he shouldn't have, and he didn't do proper testing for it. So all that is happening, on a, so accountability and on a assurance at a national level, but NATO is also exploring this, and this is a thing I think that uh, people could be in this room seeking to contribute towards um, and you know through their governments and then through their individual careers. Um, so since I've mentioned NATO, uh, obviously there's one thing that's kind of uh, been hanging over this discussion uh, and that is, uh, yeah, Vladimir Putin. Like the reason, uh, as I said at the beginning, that we're facing this kind of uh, increased risk of uh, nuclear use and nuclear war probably the highest since the 1980s, so the highest in 40 years, and arguably the highest since perhaps even before then, uh, is because of the, his uh, illegal invasion of, of Ukraine. This has obviously had this direct impact in, in terms of increasing existential risk, but it's also had a number of other kind of knock-on impacts. Um, so we heard uh, from uh, the excellent uh, researcher from CIPRI earlier, there's also impacted arms control. So back in... Um, uh, late 2019, the Biden administration made a, a, a bunch of suggestions around arms control, around nuclear, to explore what the follow-up to a new start would be, and also ar around biological weapons convention, uh, the biological weapons convention. So back in 2001, 20 years ago, there was all, they've been working throughout the 90s to get verification, which is actually being able to check whether people are following the biological weapons convention. In there, there was this verification protocol, and it was killed uh, by the US, and then 20 years later, you have now the US administration saying, no, 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 let's, let's go back to this, let's explore this. So this was very exciting for lots of uh, researchers in existential risk. And then obviously that uh, is now going, uh, uh, go, not going anywhere in particular. Um, and then New Start itself, um, people have already, you know, the, uh, Putin has withdrawn from um, uh, sharing information and, sh and doing, uh, you know, site visits and so on, is still claiming to be holding to the actual, you know, the, 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 the warhead numbers in, in New Start. But of course, New Start is also going to expire in the, on the 5th of February, 2026. Uh, you can uh, negotiate a follow-on nuclear treaty in a remarkably short amount of time. New Start was uh, negotiated in like about a year to 18 months. So you can do that, but you know, the 5th of February, 2026 is not very long. Uh, we haven't gotten that long at all, really, until then. So I think we should also be thinking about what role uh, the Nordics can play in playing a bridging role, in playing a, a role in, uh, in working on crisis tensions and working towards when these, the kind of geopolitical situation allows for it. Well, first, improving the geopolitical situation, and then when the geopolitical situation allows for it, uh, helping to lead on arms control uh, uh, suggestions in the future. I mean, the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty was a, an Irish idea. The Biological Weapons Convention Treaty was a, a, a UK idea. There's often been kind of like small or medium countries that have played a big kind of norm entrepreneur role, a, a championing role in developing these things. And as we've heard uh, also from, uh, from uh, Kayla Blomquist earlier, there's also a role with China in managing uh, the, uh, the, the another key relationship, a key aspect of great power competition, not only between uh, Russia and the West, but between China and the West. Um, great, okay. So what I've, in this uh, just brief little talk, I've uh, covered, um, you know, why I'm here suggest making some suggestions talking a bit about the awesome uh, efforts that are currently happening in, in the Nordics to reduce existential risks, some theory for why the Nordics are particularly well-placed for doing this, for playing this like role in global politics. Um, and then I've offered some possible future options for people to explore. So Iceland, what role could it play in uh, re resilient food production? Norway, what role can it play around kind of small tweaks around things like the seed vault, big things like changes to its uh, uh, sovereign wealth fund, 
and making a plan that is in everyone, you know, it's in Norwegian best interest, but it's also in the best interest of the world to move away from uh, fossil fuel production. And then suggestions uh, for uh, kind of other countries in the region to contribute to the EU AI Act passing and then being, you know, really strong and, and actually able to protect people. And then on uh, kind of nuclear defense and security issues around and AI, how we can also ensure that these things go safely and uh, securely. So, yeah, as I say, Nordics can and should be a world leader here. And, you know, in, in the beginning of my talk, it, was, it had a question mark, the Nordics, world leaders in existential risks, and I want to be able to, in five years' time, come back and say, yes, the Nordics, world leaders in reducing existential risks. So thanks very much. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Hayden, for the fantastic talk. I'm waiting for salted caramel fl flavored spirulina. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so uh, does anyone have any questions for um, Ollie? Yes. Um, I think you can guess what I'm going to mm -hmm, ask because mm -hmm. we talked about it earlier. Um, so, um, this, this seems pretty convincing. I'm excited about uh, more people exploring these avenues. But, um, of course, places like D.C., to a lesser extent, London and Brussels, are still um, really central power mm. hubs. Um, I wonder if you could make the alternative case for people in this region um, gaining skills and seeing if they can influence things there, too. What, what might that case look like? Yeah. Um, so this would be the argument about, like, don't be a world leader <laughs> in existential risk here in uh, here in the Nordics. Go to DC, go to San Francisco, go elsewhere. Uh, uh, I don't think this is a, a dilemma that just people in the Nordics face. Um, I was in uh, in Mexico City a few months ago, and this is a question that I was off. I, I was often asked, like, should I be staying in Latin America or should, should I be kind of uh, going up to the to the US? And I think it's an issue that like. I myself have faced, <laughs> and other people, you know, uh, Britain is no longer necessarily, a, you know, uh, a global great power. We're like a kind of middle level uh, uh, power, and there's a there's a fa there's a question that you know lots of British people are facing of, of like, if I really want to have impact and change uh, things for the better, should I be going to San Francisco? Should I be going to DC? Should I be going elsewhere? Um, yeah, so I think there really is like that is a thing that we're all having to uh, grapple with and 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 face. I would, you know, often say that, you know, you should just look at what the overall community is doing and where, you know, the different, where we could uh, stand to have a few more hardworking, intelligent uh, people going to try and make a difference. Thinking about your own personal fit, your own personal circumstances, things like that. I really wouldn't want to make any kind of like grand sweeping statements up here, but obviously that is a thing that, uh, that is a dilemma and a decision that we uh, all face and are all going to all have to kind of, uh, yeah, all have to grapple with. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of persuaded of this, that there is an argument for things that can be done to, uh, yeah, to experiment, to showcase and to champion, uh, and also like little tweaks like this, the, the seed vault that can just actually help overall risk. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I don't have a, I mean, that's just such a complex question that I don't really have a, that good an answer to, I'm afraid. Thank you so much. Any, any other questions? Uh, uh, thank you for a really nice talk. What I r loved about this was you were going around different countries and looking at what we could do here that could have a high impact. I wonder what methodology is there to do mm. this? Because this feels <coughs> like one should actually abstract, turn into a practice and actually have local groups figure out, okay, our mm. corner of the world, we want to do this uh, and make up these lists so we can then start pushing jointly as a community towards mm. it. 
uh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I, mean, I, I mentioned I was down in, I was in Mexico City, and uh, one thing that uh, talking to people there is, if you remember those pictures of the world map and how they it does in nuclear winter, Argentina does remarkably well, <laughs> even in the absolute worst case scenarios. Uh, and yet, that no one's really done any research on uh, why that is the case and what more could be done. So the uh, Boyd and, and Wilson in New Zealand did this kind of case study on New Zealand and they found like, oh, right, there really is this uh, huge amount of food that can, um, uh, uh, excess that's produced, but uh, New Zealand doesn't have an oil refinery, which, and all of this food is transported by uh, cars. Uh, so actually in the event of some sort of catastrophe, New Zealand would be in a real tricky position because it's not able to refine the oil that's needed to drive these cars with the food in. So that's the kind of like really detailed work that I think is really helpful and people are now looking into that uh, in, in Latin America, looking into doing a, a, that kind of case study on Argentina. So uh, I think that's really great. I'd be you know, thrilled for more people around the world to do that kind of work. Uh, methodology for it is very interesting. I think there were some cool suggestions in the, in the talk earlier today um, and in this forum post for how to think about that. Uh, but in general, I, I think I would just be very supportive of people being quite like experimental and being and tr trying to be quite innovative and trying to work out like looking at across these different risks where uh, their particular country or their particular area could uh, contribute to this kind of shared global project of reducing existential risks. Yeah, um, wonderful talk. Um, this is more almost more of a personal question I guess mm. how what got you interested in this uh, was it just talking to EA Norway and perhaps relatively um, this is very nice for me I'm obviously interested um, in this being a Norwegian mm -hmm. uh, who cares about uh, long-term policies um, but um, how can we ensure that um, people from other smaller countries also can try to leverage on the great research community, mm. uh, the great existential risk research community that exists, especially in the UK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And th you've just done a lot of work for me, which I really <laughs> How, how, how uh, can uh, people in Estonia, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Estonia, I think, is doing, uh, Estonia, you know, go talk to Jan Talen, um, it would be my main suggestion. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think the kind of network building and sharing um, uh, learning, sharing, you know, different surveys, sharing different ways of messaging, sharing different uh, policy proposals, I think, seems really good. Uh, it could be the time for some sort of journal. Uh, I don't know. Th there's been a long standing discussion about whether to have something specifically on global risks. Could be. Uh, maybe something like this that it's, you know, uh, conferences or workshops that are specific to the uh, policy community that's interested in these topics. Um, but also, I wouldn't want it to be like too specific. I'd want us to be able to draw on the, you know, excellent people that, you know, at, at, at CIPRI, at, at CEPI, and just just to, to, to name uh, two in, in the Nordic region. Um, and then how did I get interested? Yeah, just talking to people then being really nice having great conversations <laughs> and then you know one thing uh kind of leads to another yeah yeah so uh and also I, I but which is uh kind of like uh, a flippant thing to say but i think it's actually true right like th both of these questions have been kind of like how do we impose some sort of like how do we like make sure it's prioritized and method methodologically robust and so on and that's really important and good but like in politics, there's also the aspect of just like the the human and 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 networks and relationships, and I think uh, just investing in those things as well. And you know, I remember when I started working in existential risk, my first plan was like, okay, well, what we need to do is just have like 600 all the proposals to reduce existential risk, and then we'll just go through each one of them and work out how, how much it all costs, and then we'll have a prioritized list of all those 600. And I've kind of moved away from, I think that was, I mean, maybe that's like the grand dream in like uh, 10 or 15 years from now, we can, we can have that list. Uh, but uh, I think being kind of more, uh, yeah, kind of innovative, 
reactive, going with things where there is just um, policy windows and being quite like opportunistic, I think is uh, perhaps, um, I guess maybe it's a balance, right, between my uh, dream coming in of this perfect, pure ranked list and then just being completely just grabbing whatever opportunities there are. But the, yeah, somewhere in, the, somewhere in between the two of those. Awesome, thank you. I think we've uh, run out of time for questions, but if anyone has a really short question, maybe I can uh, let you ask it. If not, I think, can we yeah. have a short round of applause again? for? Great, thanks everyone, cheers. Yeah.